The Years of National Government Chapter 3 The Services Local Water Company When the local council were asked to submit schemes for land development into the la in the late 1800s, they considered the supply of water. These concerns were passed on to the Colne Valley Water Company, who undertook to supply the necessary piped water in early 1884. Ten years later, the then local authority had installed a new sewage system. The house building schemes thirty years later gratefully used these provisions, altering the gauge and pipe material whilst retaining the essential main service. As the dwellings were being designed and built, provision had to be made for recreation and open space to give health and a green environment for its inhabitants. This was first investigated at the time of the Great Exhibition, and by 1910 a local Board of Health Committee of the Harrow Urban District Council gave consideration for recreation grounds for Harrow and Roxeth. By 1925, Headstone Park was acquired, then Pinner Park, in 1930. In 1938, Harrow reserved 962 acres for a green belt. The 1894 Harrow sewage farms were turned into Kenton's recreation ground after a larger site was found. West Harrow Park and Streamside Walk joined the others as the building estates grew. Property speculators and house buyers could obtain a mortgage with an interest rate of 4.25%. These building societies didn't require large deposits. Abbey National, then called Abbey Road, registered a 700% increase in borrowers in the 10 years between 1926 and 1936. This allowed most of the lower middle class and better off working class the opportunity to buy to live. The interest rate was set at this low point to stimulate the market, which it did. The population of Harrow Weald rose from 1,500 to 11,000 and that of Pinna 3,000 to 23. North Harrow was prior to 1919 free of houses, farmland. Twenty years later all the land was built on. The one-time farmland disappeared. Gas Supplier Due north of Harrow lies the village of Stanmore. The gas works were opened there in 1859, supplying Harrow through a private contractor named John Chapman, whose business was called Stanmore Gas Company. In 1894 it was joined with Harrow District Gas Company, the two becoming Harrow and Stanmore Gas Company. The gas holders were sited at South Harrow. The company was later taken over by Brentford Gas Company in 1924 and formed part of the Gas, Light and Coke Company two years later. Electricity Company This growth coming from these new enterprises entailed electricity in one form or another. The development of the electricity supply was the most important industrial event of that period. Legislation was required to carry forward a bill that became the Electricity Supply Act of 1925. This created the Central Electricity Board formed at the time of the general strike in 1926. The board's task was to rationalise the myriad local power stations into larger units to build a new generation of power stations, all connected to a national grid of high power transmission lines. And by 1933 this goal was almost complete. It was a worldwide first, having the most advanced system of electrical supply available produced by coal-fired power stations. Prior to the First World War, the use of electricity was for the very few. In 1920, there being almost three-quarters of a million users rising to nine million by 1939. 
In 1927, one house in 17 used electricity. By 1930, one house in three rises to two out of three by 1939. It's difficult to imagine the difference having electricity made to the population, particularly to those living in the country. Before electricity, illumination was by gas, commonly used by the time of the Great Exhibition in 1851. Gradually, by the turn of the 20th century, in the, cottage, in the country cottage, candle power gave way to oil, then oil to gas. It took until the 1930s for all homes to be lit by electricity. At my grandmother's cottage in Somerset, I went to bed in the 1940s by candlelight, leaving the family below playing cards by the light of an oil lamp. The radio was powered by an accumulator and the milk was kept in the stream. After all wars there is a surge of new inventions and discoveries brought into the market. The First World War was no different. In the 1920s electricity and gas appliances started to appear. Cookers, refrigerators, water heaters and all sorts of household gadgets, including vacuum cleaners, radio sets, record players and toasters appeared, first in advertising, then in the shops. Cooking, water heating and lighting. Prior to the First World War, cooking and water heating achieved on a wooden range with an open fire next to a bread oven. The fuel would have been wood and coal. Many outhouses were built or converted to kitchen use using paraffin. Similarly, lighting was by candle and oil. Gas was being used extensively for street lighting. By the middle of the 19th century, domestic lighting and heating was a matter of fact. However, this relied upon the nearness of the gas line and gas holder for continuous pressure. When the garden suburbs were being planned and executed, gas was laid on and customers could have a choice of which power to use. Coal, gas or electricity for water and space heating and cooking. Living Standards The growth of the British economy kept place with the population. There was a baby boom in the 20s, which isn't surprising. At the other end of the age scale, the advances in medicine, sulfur drugs and penicillin, and the treatment of patients, experience gained from war casualties, raised life expectancy levels. And this rise in the working population added over three and a quarter million to the workforce. This didn't just improve production, it also raised demand. The increase in working population now included a much larger share for women. Even though returning men from the war eased women out of the jobs, more associated with men's work, the role of women would never return to those of pre-war. A far greater number of women were independent, earning their own living. Professions and occupations previously closed to women now received a number of applicants granted inclusion. Reading certain history books giving a social history of Britain, you might be led to believe that by 1929 the mass of the population were leading a life different from that lived ten years before. It wasn't so. Some men had not worked continuously since returning home from the war. Others engaged one job at a time, competing for vacancies every morning. In the early 30s, the newspapers were filled with stories of the nation's economic troubles. There were millions unemployed and stories unrest among the workers. There was real human suffering and the picture from the north of England was bad. The mills were silent, groups of idle workers on every street corner, clogs were worn and echoed on the cobbles. Scores of children were undernourished and in many towns factories were being torn down for the bricks to be sold on as seconds. Wage levels 1931 saw the faint glimmer of hope. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Neville Chamberlain, was a skilful financier he had already made a name for himself as being an excellent administrator when Minister of Health. 
Now he was to show his skill attending to the business of the nation's money. His plan was to save by introducing cuts in wages and salary of all people, not just the lower paid. In a series of stringent budgets he presided over a policy of protectionism. Great savings were made by converting two thousand million pounds of the five percent war loan to three and a half. By this time the schemes for house building had begun and more of the money saved went into rearming the nation. By 1937 the 15 to 64 age group represented nearly 70 percent of the working population. This added three quarters of a million to the workforce over a period of 13 years. The increase in birth rate, life expectancy and the resultant consumer spending generated by both increased national output. These five key decisions protectionism, reduced wages, realigned interest rates, stimulated house building and rearmament saw the nation slowly begin to recover. It began a ten-year cycle of improvement and this program was mainly directed towards the industrial section of society. Light engineering, the new sources of power and the service industries were never as seriously affected by the depression. Public Health The period 1929 to 1939 saw a general improvement in the public standard of health. As well as a reduction in the death rate, there was an improvement in a child's life expectancy. Deaths dropping by 10%. The normal teenager's death rates from scarlet fever, diphtheria, whooping cough and measles greatly improved, doubling in 20 years. There was a steady improvement in adult weight and height. The 1937 survey of the social structure of England and Wales considered that it was the improvement in housing, water provision, sanitation, hygiene and the advances in medi medical skill. This was a common practice service engaged in throughout England, all covered by the 1936 Public Health Act, extended later to include the Food and Drugs Act. Piped water was provided to my grandmother's cottage in Somerset in 1935. The new housing estates the local planning authorities' concern for recreational space, the nation's completed sewer system, improved nutritional diets and greater health provision through local cottage hospitals, maternity units and nursing and auxiliary services, all contributed to improved standards in public health. And by 1934, an act was passed empowering local authorities to make free or subsidised milk available to school children. This was distributed in third of a pint bottles by classroom monitors providing a straw for each child. And three years later, over three million children had the opportunity to buy to drink milk. By 1935, the year of my birth, there were 2,300 doctors and 5,300 nursing sisters engaged in servicing the school's medical services. In 1936, local authorities had to provide trained midwives. and By 1939, all schools in Harrow and District provided subsidised school meals, a percentage free for the needy. The National Insurance Act of 1912 applied to nearly 12 million workers. By 1921, 15 million and finally 20 million by 1938, the scheme provided a free doctor service. For families of insured workers, included most of the middle classes, reliance placed upon private schemes and sick, sick clubs. Other health services had to be paid for. Payment for a visit to the hospital in 1928 was a two-tier arrangement split between local authorities and voluntary hospitals. Only the very poor had free treatment. And as can be imagined, death rates occurred higher in poor areas of the country. 
Harrow was considered to be the best place to receive medical treatment and your chance of survival from treatments far greater. In 1930, the BMA suggested a system of health insurance for practically all adults and their dependents. This would include dentists, maternity and ophthalmology. It took over 15 years for the National Health Service to be fully operational after the Second World War. Waste Collection The dust cart came round once a week, on a Wednesday. The lorry was painted green and the collection was tipped into domed compartments covered by bowed sliding doors. Anything which could not be placed in the back of the cart was put on the roof. Every house had its own metal bin. I don't remember any complaint about having too much rubbish or throwing away an awkward shape or extra heavy item. Everything was taken away without question by the dustman. The welfare state. As employment rose, as unemployment rose after the general strike into the 30s, a series of government acts were passed to provide extra levels of benefit. It was soon transparent that there were gaps in the payments, benefits and contributions. Many of the poor still had to apply to the, for the poor, poor law and after 1929 to the public assistance committees of the local authorities. The government soon recognised the gaps, especially the exceptional diversity of employment. The Unemployment Assistance Board Acts of 1934-35 still didn't seal the gaps and a further series of acts were needed. It took until 1937 for the majority of the unemployed that received assistance under the public assistance committees of the local authority transferred to the Unemployment Assistance Board. By the early 20s the Family Endowment Society was advising a national family allowance system providing 12 and sixpence per week for mothers and five bob for the first child and three and six for each subsequent child. This suggestion never got off the ground. It was considered by the government that this would destroy work incentives and reduce the mobility of labour. In 1931-32, Chamberlain took the issue out of the local authority hands and set up the Unemployment Assistant Board in 1934. It took until 1939-40, when the government gave give way, when the government gave way, but not for the original social reasons, but to suppress wage claims, labour disputes, and therefore to control inflation. But the wedge was in. The Beveridge Report in 1942 made family allowance a cornerstone of social insurance. Church and State It's perfectly understandable to find in census figures that congregations shrank after each war and did so throughout the passing centuries. The First World War had a profound effect on a society staggering from the unsettling result of a shifting population, buffeted and confused by industrialization. These uncertainties took their toll. Increasingly in the twenties, nonconformists made inroads upon the established church. It wasn't because they required less commitment, but less rigid and prescribed behavior. Their services complemented by a song, colourful tracts and religious leaflets, drew in their congregations, giving them a sense of belonging. Although the graph for York shows that Anglican attendees continued to dominate until after the Second World War, the nonconformists were waiting to take up the reins soon after that. The figures for Catholics, on the other hand, show a steady rise throughout the whole period and this was borne out by what, by what was happening in North Harrow. Between the wars, the attendance figures for Baptist, Wesleyan, Methodist, United Free Church and Congregationalist showed little change. Their attendance figures reflected the strength of the connection of the youth association adopted by that church or chapel. A strong boys' brigade company saw a strong congregation. Similarly, scout group or church lads' movement 
for well-established churches and chapels that catered for the full range of young people, the attendances were higher still. And as with all institutions, if they weren't run by a team of dedicated officers over a long period, and if the takeover after they retire is sound, church attendance figures stayed consistent. Although church attendances steadily declined from the early strict Victorian period throughout all social classes, society continued to adhere to the church's principles and teachings. And from the end of the thirties into the war years and beyond, those principles and teachings had been undermined, disregarded and in some cases abandoned. Nevertheless, the values influences the new influence in the new culture were Christian and continued. <laughs>